Konnichiwa. Today, we're going to talk about building a mass immersion environment. And this is probably the most crucial question of all in acquiring Japanese. Let's be brutally frank. Most people who attempt to learn Japanese fail. Why do they fail? Now, it's true that among any group of people who start out learning something that takes a lot of effort, there will be a reasonably high dropout rate. But the number of people who put serious effort into learning Japanese and never become competent is far above what that dropout rate ought to be. Why? Well, let's take another case for comparison. We all know of people, have seen people on the internet who are not native speakers of English, but who use it very competently. We see them on forums, we see them in blogs, we see them on YouTube, we see them everywhere. Often they may speak with a strong accent. Sometimes they may use expressions that sound a bit strange, but they are using English and they're using it very competently and successfully as a means of communication. What is the difference between these people and the many people who attempt to learn Japanese and never get very far? Bearing in mind that at least a certain proportion of them are in fact the same people. So it isn't that there's something special and different about people who are not native speakers of English. There's something special and different about English. What is it? Well, the fact is that these non-native English speakers who use the internet in English so very competently mostly do so because they don't really have any choice. If your native language is Finnish or Croatian or Swedish, then the internet for you is a far, far smaller place if you don't speak English. If you have minority interests, such as, for example, learning Japanese and you want to learn about it online and discuss it online, if you have no command of English, you're out of luck. Even if your native language is something like French or German, the internet for you is a far, far smaller place if you don't know English. Some people may argue that part of the reason for this competency is that nearly everybody across the world learns English in school. Now this is helpful up to a point, but think about it for a moment. Most native English speakers learn another language in school. It might be Spanish or it might be French. And very few of them can hold even a couple of minutes conversation at a very low level in those languages. So learning a language in school, it may give you a slight advantage, but it certainly isn't something that makes you competent in a language. What makes you competent in a language is needing it and using it. In other words, what makes you competent in a language is having an immersion environment. These people who speak English so well are in an immersion environment. They're using English because they need it in order to communicate and in order to receive information. There's no escape. They can't fall back on Finnish or Croatian if they don't know a word or if they don't understand a sentence or if they don't know how to say something. It's English, sink or swim. And this is what an immersion environment is. And this is what makes the difference between learning a language and picking at the edges of it for years. So what can we do about this in the case of Japanese? People who are digitally immersing in English have a couple of very big advantages. There are lots of places to do it, but also they really have no choice. They really have no escape. Katsumoto san once said that infants aren't better at learning languages than adults. They just have no escape routes. And while I think there is a difference between children and adults in language learning, and I've made a video about that, I think this matter of escape routes is of fundamental importance. And let me explain why. The human mind has its own scale of values. It's going to have that scale of values regardless of anything you tell it. The scale of values is fundamentally based on survival. And because of this, the human mind gives a very special and privileged place 
to language because language is necessary for communication and communication is necessary for survival. It also has another reason for giving language this uniquely privileged position. And that is that nearly everything the mind does is based on language. Even things that you probably think of as being nothing to do with language, like looking at colors. What we perceive as red and what we perceive as blue is fundamentally based on how our language has decided to divide up the spectrum. Different cultures, different languages have different ideas of color and of where the boundaries between the colors lie. So nearly everything the mind does is based in language. So language is vital for survival. Language is vital for thought. The mind gives a specially privileged position to language because the mind, to a very large extent, is language. It privileges language especially above what it perceives as games. Now when I say games, what I mean is closed systems that relate only to themselves. Chess is a very good example. But it doesn't just have to be things that we recognize as games. Geometry is another example. And languages that we are learning are another example. If we learn French or Japanese in class and we do exercises and we learn vocabulary and we occasionally have a conversation with our classmates and then laugh about it in English the minute we've finished, this is not language to the mind. This is another game. It's not going to put it in the privileged position that it puts language and it's not going to give it the priority it needs to work properly. This is why immersion environments are crucial. The non-English speaker in an English language forum is not playing a game. She's actually trying to learn and communicate. And English is not the object of the exercise, it's the means toward the object of the exercise. In other words, it is language. This is what an immersion environment means. And without this, Learning language is very difficult and very often doomed. So what do we do about creating an immersion environment? Well, we're going to talk about the input side of this today. Now, it doesn't have to be all Japanese all the time. Of course, it would be ideal if it was, but most people can't manage this. So what we have to do is decide which parts of our life we're going to fence off as immersion territory. Now we could do this by time. We can say that so many hours a day are dedicated to Japanese immersion, not to learning Japanese, not to English language grammar books or videos like this, but to actually using Japanese. Or we can do it by areas of our life. When I started learning Japanese during the first year, which was fairly early, but I was very intense, I decided that all discretionary recreational activities would from then on be in Japanese. So if I wanted to play a game and I couldn't play it in Japanese, then I couldn't play it. If I wanted to watch an anime and I couldn't watch it in Japanese, then I couldn't watch it. If I wanted to read a book and I couldn't read it in Japanese, then I couldn't read it. If I could only half understand an anime in Japanese, then I could only half understand it and I would just have to try to grow up quickly, wouldn't I, so that I could understand it at a deeper level. For me, I have to say this was not some self-denying ordinance. I had very little interest in Western media. Practically everything I consumed was translated from Japanese anyway. And I love Japanese to the point where I would much, much, much rather do it partially in Japanese than do it wholly in English. You may not want to go that far, but you could choose a particular area of your life that you're going to fence off as Japanese territory, for example, playing games. Now, we could think about your reaction to that. If your reaction is, well, I don't play many games anyway and they're not that important to me, so that's fine, then it's not going to be very much use to you. If you're thinking, I really love games and I love text-heavy RPGs and visual novels, so I'm not sure about fencing them all off into Japanese. Well, the point is that would be perfect for you if you're prepared to do it, because then you've got this huge incentive and you really will 
trying to read them in Japanese, you're putting yourself in the position of the foreign learner of English in the English language forum. You really want the content that's there, and the only way to get it is through English. And unfortunately, if your native language is English, or if you've become competent in English, Japanese isn't often going to present that kind of compulsion. So if you really want to become competent in Japanese, you have to set it up for yourself. In the end, this depends how much you want to do it. And if you don't want to do it, well, don't do it. But bear in mind that this is probably the one thing you really need to actually acquire Japanese to a high level of competence. Now, on a practical matter, I think people often ask is what about looking up words? If I do it in English, am I breaking the spell? Am I breaking the immersion? I would say no. If you think about the non-native learner of English coming across an English word that she doesn't know, she's very likely going to look it up in a Croatian English dictionary. Why wouldn't she? Some people say you should stay completely in Japanese, which often involves, as I've explained before, these 50 deep dictionary dives in which you have to look up one word in Japanese and then look up three or four words in the definition and then three or four words in each of those definitions. And if you have three hours for Japanese immersion, most of it's gone on dictionary diving. I don't think this is a good way to learn. What I would suggest is starting off by looking up the word on somewhere like the Sanseido online dictionary, I'll link it below, which gives short and simple definitions of words. If you can't understand that definition, then look at it in English. But what you should put in your Anki, if at all possible, is the Japanese definition, or else a Japanese sentence that makes the word clear to you. I've explained about doing this in my video on the minimal use of Anki, so I'll link that in a card here. What we've talked about today is really only the very basics of setting up a self-immersion Japanese environment, but the basics are what you really need. After that, how you go about setting up your own Japanese immersion environment depends on you, on your circumstances, on how far you want to take it, and on what you love, and which area or areas of Japanese you want to dive into and sink or swim. But believe me, if you have the will to do it, you will swim, and you will become confident in Japanese. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comments below, and I will answer as usual. I'd like to thank my Gold Kokeshi patrons, my producer Angels, who make these videos possible, and all my patrons and supporters on Patreon and everywhere. And I'd like to thank you for attending this lesson. Kore kara mo, yoroshiku onigaishimasu. Class dismissed.